So let me explain how we ended up doing 45 kilometers an hour along the B112 in Botswana. And it's all my fault. But in order to do that, let's go back a couple of days and show you what happened. We spent the night at Nata Bird Sanctuary and while there we had met Tyron and his brother Cameron who were busy winging it around Botswana, their newly acquired 2002 TD5 Defender. Tyron has a YouTube channel called Adventure with Togs, so look it up. I'll share the link below. down the main road here, mm -hmm. we'll this cut line, the first cut line, all the way down there. Okay. To cut a long story short, the brothers took up the invitation to join us while we travelled back towards Johannesburg using some cut lines with some scenic stops along the way. And with the Campanion still rocking side to side due to its failed tough dog shock absorbers, we set off on the 45 km tar stretch before heading back onto the dirt on our first cut line which would take us to Kukunya Island. To explain, Botswana is divided up into a bunch of straight lines that are usually fenced. There are different explanations for these cut lines. Some say they were established during the old diamond prospecting days where the graders were used to clear straight grid lines on the ground before, for the prospectors. But the better, most common explanation is that these cut lines were established to stop animals from spreading foot and mouth disease. All I know is some of them, in fact most of them, are brilliant to travel along. When travelling on cut lines, conditions can continually change and the track can vary from excellent dirt tracks, deep sandy tracks, crossing of pans, cotton soil and some technical sections mostly caused by erosion and lack of maintenance. I would not tackle many of these cut lines during the rainy season due to possible flooding and many of these cut lines, especially the further east you go, can turn into quote miles of bottomless sticky mud that has claimed many a vehicle. I would also not tackle any cut lines unless you have a backup plan for rescue if things go wrong. So for example, let friends and family know your routes and then have check-in times when possible or have a come find me deadline date. And most importantly, please don't leave your vehicle if you do run into trouble. Okay, so we found our little camp spot that we used in 2016 last, it's been a while, next to the Museti River. Museti River is there where those green trees are. And just in the dip here, probably about 50 meters away. And the reason I like this spot is most cut lines are dead straight for many kilometers. And uh, if you make a fire, obviously people can see you for many, from many kilometers away. So there's a nice little S bend. And uh, what that does is it reduces the chance of people seeing you and uh, keeps you a little bit safer. Because you know, people are what keep you, people are dangerous. Animals are not so dangerous. But anyway, this is a nice little camp spot. We're not going to stay here because we're going to head to Kukunya Island.
There is always something special about arriving on the Makhari Hari pans, whether it's your first time being there or not. As the pans open up in front of you, it's exciting. It's always uplifting to everyone's spirits. It feels almost like you have conquered a hard journey through dense bush and forest and now you have finally broken through a last bit of scrub into the open. You have to protect your eyes from the sudden brightness caused by the pan surface reflecting the sun. Maybe it's the vast expanse of nothingness or the silence with only the wind to hear. Or perhaps it's just the unbelievable flat, almost lunar type vista. I don't know, but you always must stop and just take it all in. There are not many places in the world like this. So stop, take your time, wander out onto the pan, onto some of the untouched surface and listen to the surface cracking and crunching under your shoes. Pose for as many pictures and videos as you can and let the kids loose and try and take it all in. For want of a better word, and to use a very overused word, it is magical. Lying southeast of the Okavango Delta and surrounded by the Kalahari Desert, the Makhari Khadi is technically not a single pan, but many pans with sandy desert in between, the largest being Sour Pan. The pan is all that remains of the formerly enormous Lake Makhari Khadi, which once covered an area larger than Switzerland, but dried up tens of thousands of years ago. Kukunya Island lies on the opposite side of Sour Pan to Kuba Island and is arguably as beautiful in its own way. I honestly don't understand why it's not more popular to be honest. To me, having the entire island to ourselves with no one around makes it arguably more attractive than the often overcrowded, sometimes noisy Kuba Island. Is this our site for tonight? If you like it, we skip it. Yeah. It's hard not to like it, eh? After dropping off the trailer, we explored the island a little. Now when doing this, please don't venture too far from the island onto the pans and keep to existing tracks. I was saddened to see, even at the less popular Kukunyo Island, there were vehicle tracks all over the place where clearly people have been playing around. The pans can be very treacherous and under a thin crust, the thick and very slimy mud is waiting to swallow your heavy 4x4, so be careful when you drive there. I know people who took over four hours to dig out adventure motorbikes after it had broken through the crust. So be careful in your much heavier vehicles. Always straddle established tracks and don't go off the well used tracks and routes. And when stopping and parking on the pans, stick to the sides where you're sure it's firm. Sometimes the crust layer can be very thin. Think of a freshly baked loaf of bread with its crust and soft insides. Okay, so Amri is now driving and taken over the piloting of the ship and I must admit I'm a bit scared. Hi. Go left. I'm scared. Where do you want me to go? I don't know. Just drive.
Aaron is making his brother walk all the way up to the top of the hill to film us coming up. How nice is that? Tyron, you're a tough big brother, but... Cameron did an awesome job. Thanks, Cam. If you visit Kukunya Island, make sure to go up to the viewpoint, which is probably about 50 meters above the pan surface and gives you a nice 180 degree view of the south and the eastern side of the pan. It's well worth the trip. I must admit, it was good to be outside the landy for a change and see both the new and the old defenders driving through the bush together. They are so similar and yet so different. This is a group shot, because Heath, I don't know, he's like getting all artistic here. He actually looks a bit like Hulk Hogan. I'm putting it at Good job, Heath, and thanks for the pick. After the viewpoint, we headed back to the campsite. And you're probably still wondering why I was doing 45 kilometers an hour along the B112 on the way to Balapololi. But we'll get there. This is one of my favorite campsites on the pans as you camp under incredible baobab and you have the best view over Sour Pan directly towards the sunset. After a great meal and with a view of the setting sun over Sour Pan we watched the Milky Way rise. Truly spectacular. Tyron and I then decided to try our hand at taking some star pictures. Now in all honesty we are complete novices and I have especially no idea what the buttons and settings are meant to be for taking star pictures. But after some playing and fiddling and experimenting using torches, headlights and even a laser pointer, surprisingly we did manage to get a few great pictures. But don't ask me what the settings I used were as they pretty much were a bit of luck that I got them. The next morning, after a warm shower under the baobab, with a view over the pans, and then bearing our ash and making sure everything in the campsite was as we found it, we headed off to continue our journey along the cut line towards the central Kalahari. But first we had to get some more pictures, videos and some more drone footage of the pans. The pans do that to you. <laughs> Now our three vehicles couldn't be more different, with different setups, different years of production, different motors, different wheels, you name it, they're totally different. And yet we all had a great time, proving that you don't need all the things and the bells and the whistles to get out there. Just get out there and explore. We 
did stop at the entrance gate where a few abandoned and dilapidated rondalbos are in the hope that we could pay our fees, but no one was in sight and they were clearly run down and hadn't been used for a long time. So we continued our journey. Next time, we'll pay double. It was such a great opportunity to compare the three vehicles, one towing, one with air suspension and one with traditional solid axles and, and springs. The first time I had driven this track was in December of 2011. It was very interesting to see how much the track had degraded since then. Obviously it was a wet season versus dry season, but looking at these culverts, they had really been abused over the years. It was also clear that the tough dog shock absorbers on the Conqueror had completely given up and the Conqueror was riding on springs only. I attempted to do a then and now from memory and I didn't quite get it right but this will give you an idea how it looked in 2011 during the rainy season compared to now in 2022 during the dry season. When traveling these cut lines, never do them when you have to be at a place at a certain time or date. Take your time, be flexible and enjoy the route. We did not see much game along this track, but we're very surprised to see a lot of evidence of elephants everywhere. We also saw a few leopard tortoises and two very big black mambas, of which one I almost ran over and missed by centimeters. Hard ground the last time I was here. Yeah, yeah. 
But no, I, I gotta say that's traffic, you know? that's uh, that road is probably the funnest, <laughs> nerve-wracking, <laughs> and most adrenaline pumping road I've ever been on. <laughs> But let your tires down, don't be lazy like Bruce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah geez, like what a difference. difference eh? Thick sand, tires go right down. Yeah. Now, cruising in some parts of fourth gear, like one and a half thousand. Do you want to be depressed? Yeah. I had my cruise control at 45 k's an hour with your finger cut. Oh, read between the lines, eh? <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, oh, let's go find a campsite. Yeah, yeah. So, let's just drive. You choose a campsite. It's up to you tonight. Oh, my goodness. It's up to okay, you. Right pressure's here. all on you. <laughs> okay, a little bit about sand driving. We all know we must let down tires, but we all, well, I especially, yeah, and I'm sure as most of you, do get a little bit lazy and complacent sometimes, and you think, ah, it's, it's only 100 k's of sand. We'll be all right. And uh, I didn't let down tires, and I actually regret it because um, the sand got really thick unexpectedly. The track has changed since I last drove it, and uh, we, we then decided to slow down and just drop pressures down to about 1.5 bar. And I tell you, it's changed the driving style. It's a lot easier on the car. There's a lot less chance of getting stuck. The car's just happier. I think we're happier also in the car. So don't be lazy like Bruce. Let down those tire pressures and then keep your momentum. Um, this track has been really tough because it's used by all sorts of 4x4 trucks uh, which leave a different wheelbase to what we've got. But if you let down your tires it's pretty easy going. A few kilometers down the road Tyron picked out a place to stop just in time to set up camp, start the fire and enjoy the sunset. We had the Central Kalahari Game Reserve on the one side of the road and empty bushland and farmland on the other side of the road. What a perfect place to stop. Okay, so for this company, from Natal, Epic Chow sent me some of these things. It's uh, dried out or dehydrated food, which I've never tried before. I was a little bit um, unsure about them, but to be honest with you, it's actually quite nice. And I'm not advertising it, I'm just giving you guys ideas for, you know, when you arrive at camp late at night. I mean, and apologies to all the vegans out there, but we had this vegan veggie chili the other night with a T-bone steak, it was brilliant. So, Maybe not the best choice of meat with the dish because it's not vegan, but you know, please don't be offended. And then we also had, uh, Amri, what was that breakfast thing that we had? Oats. Yeah. We had we oats, which oats. muesli oats and everything, which came with like fruit and nuts and everything with it. And it was actually really nice. So just an idea for when you arrive late at night, because everyone slows me down on my trips. You've seen now, I mean, these guys that have joined us now, they've made us arrive like 10 minutes ago and it's dark. You know, these old landy drivers. <laughs> so Heath, this is your first overlanding trip in your Discovery 5 Star, which is slightly modified with 18 inch wheels. What is your honest opinion of this type of travel? You've kept it simple and slept in your car, but what, did, what stood out for you the most? What are you going to tell your family when you get home? Uh, sure, there's been quite a few. So for me, I, I think probably maybe the quiet times, the sunset, mm. kind of just chilling, reflecting back on the day. That to me is probably the, the special time. So maybe that 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 wetland that we we found that that we went and spent a bit of time at, and uh, you know, looking at the birds there, watching the sunset, and just listening to the sounds of Africa. I mean, it was phenomenal. That was definitely a special spot, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Cameron, what are you doing here? We picked you up yesterday on the side of the road at Nata Bird Sanctuary. Yes, How did you end up here? We ended up here in a beautiful Land Rover Defender 110. Who's we? Me and my brother, Tyron. So, introduce yourselves. 
before we come as a package. Thank <laughs> 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 you. And what for you has stood out about your trip? I mean, you only joined us to go to Kokunya Island and not to Birds actually, yeah. and now on this cut line. But what stood out about your trip? Going to Ngaipan National Park and arriving in the camp with probably one of the biggest elephants I've ever seen in my life. And then standing outside the car while this male elephant walking literally three meters away from us. It's quite incredible for me. Tyron, give us your channel name. Well, you can all follow my adventures through Africa on uh, Adventures with Togs on YouTube or on Instagram, Exploring Southern Africa. So yeah, if you want to check out any of my videos, go to Adventures with Togs. And what uh, vehicle are you driving? Oh, just got a 2002 TD5 Defender 110. Absolutely my lifelong dream is to have a, a Defender, an old style Land Rover Defender. So I'm so chuffed with it. Absolutely loving the thing. Oh, what was your favorite part of the trip? Oh, there's, there's too many. Well, first of all, I've always wanted to bring my brother on this trip or well, to come explore Botswana. What I, what I really love about like, overlanding like this is that you don't actually know where you're going to be that night. Every day you've got a new campsite and everyone is different. So you're, like, you know, you're driving on exciting roads and you're seeing animals and... You don't know where you're going to sleep that night and mm. every time you get there is something different and something absolutely beautiful about it. Last night we were under a, a massive old baobab tree which is gorgeous in its own way and then now we're just chilling on a road. <laughs> and it's awesome. More of a <laughs> track. More awesome. of a track. <laughs> yeah. That's been quite then, busy. <laughs> yeah, we've seen two cars in about four hours, eh? <laughs> or two well, trucks. Too many, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this this whole experience has been awesome. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. So you're going to do a lot more cut lines in the future? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Little trick that uh, to keep you warm. Coals under your seats. <laughs> Check everyone smiling now. They got warm. <laughs> Behinds. It is. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's lovely. Yes, I never thought it would work so well. The temperatures really plummeted that night, leaving frost covering everything, reminding everyone that we were heading back south to a very cold Johannesburg. This is the road we're going to have to tackle this morning. We spoke to a few locals driving big 4x4 trucks last night and they say that uh, there's a lot of sand ahead and this isn't so bad here, so it's going to be fun. <laughs> After some quick calculations and knowing that my fuel consumption wouldn't get much better, I was growing a little bit concerned about the fuel that I had. And then this happened. <laughs> Bruce, do you want to explain yourself? Tyrone, you should never have told me not to get extra fuel. <laughs> this is a real rookie mistake of mine. Oh, yeah. I went against what I always preach. I didn't carry spare fuel just in case. And with the thick sand and this trailer, I would have double the fuel that I would normally have. Thanks to Tyron, for sponsoring my remaining part of my trip in the fuel. Thanks for the sponsorship, Tyron. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you're going to make it even. Oh, do I have to even give on that? that? <laughs> do I have to give this fuel back? Yeah, man. I'm so, I saw a couple of uh, <laughs> <laughs> rum at the back there. <laughs> Yeah. Now, Tyron, you saved the day. No, okay, I'm showing help, everybody eh? what not to do when you travel. Okay, so yeah. this is a lesson. I did. I planned this. Oh, it, oh it's like it's a planned well, exhibition you, of what not to do. Well, you've taught me so much this trip already. <laughs> Appreciate this. <laughs> Even with an extra 20 liters in the belly of the Defender, we were not out of the woods yet. 
We still had around 60 kilometers of sand tracks, which thankfully soon became hard sand tracks, and then about 100 kilometers of tar before we could fill up again. We needed a plan B. And that is what caused us to be on the B112 to Malapololi, doing 45 kilometers now. With 46 kilometers to go and 21 kilometer range, and Cameron laughing at us for some reason, the decision was made to send the old landy to fetch some much needed fuel while we continued to limp on for as far as possible without our air conditioners, cruise control, or anything else turned on that could possibly affect our fuel consumption. I must admit to thinking I hope they get fuel. And as the Laughing Brothers accelerate away from us at a blistering pace, I must admit that part of me thought they wouldn't be back. <laughs> but let's be honest, doing 45 kilometers an hour on the B112 towards Malapaloli was far better than being stopped next to the B112 with no fuel in our tanks. Breaking down with Bruce, new Instagram handle coming up. <laughs> I could already sense Almery and Heath plotting against me, but thankfully a familiar silhouette appeared on the horizon and as it came closer, the unmistakable rattle of a TD5 could be heard. It was our saviors, Tyron and Cameron. They did come back and they did have fuel, thankfully. <laughs> After filling up with 20 litres of fresh, life-saving diesel, literally life-saving, <laughs> we were off to Malapololi to brim the tanks and at the first petrol station we could find before heading back to South Africa. A massive thank you to Tyron and Cameron for fetching us some fuel so that we could make it back to the next filling station. Thank you to Tyron, Cameron, Heath and Almarie for providing me with extra footage for this episode as well as being some awesome traveling companions. So, I hope you've all enjoyed this episode and uh, I hope you're looking forward to the next one because the next one, I'm back in Zimbabwe and it's going to be an epic trip. The Chasing Smiles tour of Zimbabwe kicks off at the Drummond Farm and then heads to a tennis coaching clinic near Harare. I then explore Harare on foot before I head to the Eastern Highlands where I find some amazing places that should not be missed and need to be visited. While I'm there, I try and conquer my fear of heights to show you some of the views. So until next time, thank you so much for your support and for watching and I hope you've enjoyed this series. 